Hello and welcome. This webinar is designed to explain to women why they need to focus on their physical preparation and recovery from breast reconstruction surgery. My name is Dr Deidre McGee. I'm a physiotherapist and a researcher from Breast Research Australia based at the University of Wollongong. And I'm joined here by a panel of clinical experts. Welcome, Dean. Hi, Deidre. Uh, I'm from the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Women's Hospital, and uh, I'm a plastic surgeon with a specific interest in breast reconstruction. And you've been performing breast reconstruction for? Uh, around 12 years. Hi, I'm Monique. I'm a breast care nurse based within the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre. I've been working as a breast care nurse for the last 10 years and have a, able to support women from the time of diagnosis all the way through and have a special interest in supporting women in their decision making and care post breast reconstruction. Louise. Hello, my name's Louise Colmeyer. I'm an occupational therapist and a lymphedema therapist working at the ALERT program at Macquarie University. ALERT stands for the Australian Lymphedema Education, Research and Treatment Program. I am a researcher and a clinician. I work with women at all stages along the breast cancer journey and my real passion is in the early detection and early management of lymphedema. So this webinar is part of an online educational resource that includes a podcast, a series of videos and then this information from clinical experts. And the catalyst for this educational resource which has been uh, made by both Breast Research Australia and Breast Cancer Network Australia was a study that was conducted by Breast Research Australia on Australian women and we looked at the physical side effects that women had from breast reconstruction surgery and the effect the side effects had on the physical limitations in terms of physical activity or sport or recreation. The study found that women experienced a wide range of physical problems after their breast reconstruction surgery. From problems in their shoulder, their scar, their donor site, physical disturbance of their sleep, so physical pain actually stopping these women from sleeping, and physical discomfort from wearing a bra. Now at six months post-surgery, these were experienced in terms of sleep and bra discomfort by over half the women. Now you could say, oh, bra discomfort, you know, is that really a problem? Well, considering women wear bras for 12 to 14 hours a day, seven days a week, that's a really long time for women to be uncomfortable. And then we also know from previous research that finding a comfortable bra to exercise in is actually a problem women have that's a barrier to them being physically active. And some women were so uncomfortable they couldn't even wear a bra. So we know bras are really important to help women being physically active. So therefore bra discomfort's a really big problem. And physical discomfort disturbing women from sleeping is slowing down their healing because sleeping is really important to promote the healing process. Overall, these physical problems were not only unpleasant, but they also affected the women's ability to be physically active, to do daily tasks like hanging out washing, doing their hair, lifting their grandchildren, driving their car. So women had over half the women six months after the surgery had problems doing those daily tasks because of these physical problems. Over half the women also had problems just being physically active. So we know physical activity and exercise is so important to decrease the risk of the cancer coming back. So if women have physical problems and they can't be physically active, then we're affecting their risk of cancer reoccurrence. So we really need to help women to become more physically active. We need to remove the barriers to physical activity. At six months down the track, over half the women could not return to their sport. So it's not like women just bounced back and they got back to how they were magically after their breast reconstruction. Within this study, however, there were all different types of breast reconstruction. And we know that different types of breast reconstruction can affect physical function in different ways. Dean, can you describe the different types of breast reconstruction and the effects that it can have, these different types can have on a woman's physical function? 
So there's, there's two main types of breast reconstruction. Uh, one type is using uh, implants, so that's implant reconstruction. The other type is using tissue. So typically um, an implant reconstruction will be a two-stage procedure. The first stage involves the mastectomy and insertion of a tissue expander, which is basically a silicon balloon. And usually that sits underneath the muscle. Uh, the second stage procedure involves in inserting a breast implant. And sometimes we, we skip the first stage and do it as a one stage thing. So in that either way, you're putting an implant usually underneath the, one of the pectoral muscles. So that involves damaging that muscle, it involves cutting the muscle. So that can have effects on the, the muscle itself, uh, the shoulder, uh, the chest wall. So those are the main sort of local uh, things that are affected. So. Uh, with the other form of reconstruction, uh, it's a tissue reconstruction. And typically we use the abdomen for that. So typically the same piece of uh, tissue that's removed in a tummy tuck, so that's the, the skin and the, the fat from the tummy, is removed and that's uh, then used to uh, recreate the breast mound after the mastectomy has been performed. So that uh, and, and, and the other tissue options, the other common ones are the thigh uh, or the back. All those tissue options have another area of the body that's affected by the surgery. So therefore you have two areas to heal. Um, generally they don't involve muscle being taken, but they can, but you still have to heal the skin uh, and the fascial layers, uh, and in some cases cope with the loss of a muscle. So uh, if you look at the back, for example, where the muscle is removed from the back and then moved to the front, that's a latissimus dorsi uh, reconstruction, that will affect one of the major muscles from the back and then you're moving a muscle from the back to the front, that's gonna have quite a, a profound in, impact on, on patient's function. So in terms of the side effects from the, from the tissue reconstruction, it tends to vary from uh, tissue uh, donor site. So obviously the tummy will have a different effect to the back and, and so on. Uh, and as an example, uh, some women may find that, you know, they have specific shoulder issues that might lead us to choose a different form of reconstruction for that, that sort of patient. So if we take the extremes, we said, oh, which type of reconstruction would have the least physical side effects to which type of reconstruction would have the most physical restrictions of a woman immediately post-op? Where would you put it? I think the, the back operations tend to have the most. I think that you then usually have to affect also, the, so the pectoral muscles, often there's an implant involved in that procedure. so. Often you have the implant that's been put underneath the pectoral muscles, so the pectoral muscles and the muscles on the front are affected. The shoulders involved uh, generally in, in some way, and the muscles are controlling it, and then the back muscles. So I think that the, the back procedure where the muscles move from the back to the front has the most profound. Uh, and then studies have shown that the, the tummy one has the least. Um, in the tummy one, you don't tend to cut the pectoral muscles. So the muscles are, that are moving your shoulder tend to be less affected. Uh, and then the middle one tends to be the implant ones. And then in the immediate post-op period for a woman who's had a tummy, uh, a tissue-based one from the abdomen, is that gonna be painful for her to move? Yeah, definitely. So if, if you know, the, the tummy one involves a long uh, incision across the lower part of the abdomen, and, and people find it variable uh, some people say that it's it's no worse than doing a big workout at the gym or a cesarean section where other people find it quite uncomfortable and they do take long to recover. Uh, if the muscle is removed as part of that operation, which is sometimes the case, then the recovery is a little bit more. Um, so certainly the tummy one uh, can, can have, um, you know, a longer rehabilitation uh, because of the, you know, the damage effectively that's occurred to the tummy. So in the immediate post-op period, you've got if they've had an implant, the shoulder area is affected, and then if they've had a tissue-based, it's going to be the shoulder and some other part. That's right. Wherever that donor site is from. Yeah, definitely. So if, if you've got two surgical sites and you've got two areas to heal, so um, two areas to recover. And, to cover uh, from. Yeah. Interestingly, when we looked at the women who had quite severe physical problems after their breast reconstruction, a high percentage of those women actually had problems before their breast reconstruction. So they had limitations of their shoulder from say, their radiotherapy or their mastectomy, 
or they'd had a previous rotator cuff tear or a frozen shoulder. So they came in to their breast reconstruction with a physical limitation of their shoulder or maybe of their back if they had a spinal fusion or a, uh, a, a previous back problem. And when we asked those women, did you tell the surgeon before your operation that you had this physical problem? Across the board, they said no, that they didn't. And we asked them why, and they said, well, we thought that if it was important, that the surgeon would have asked me rather than me asking them. Dean, how important is it for a surgeon to know before a breast reconstruction if the patient has a physical limitation already or if they have a particular physical desire that they want to be able to do after the breast reconstruction, such as return to tennis or golf or, squ or squash? How important is it that you know that before the surgery? Look, it's really important, Deirdre. We, we really like to know as much as we can about their patients, uh, about our patients before we operate on them. Um, it's really important to know lifestyle things and pre-existing injuries are really important to know about, particularly of the shoulder, which does tend, unfortunately, to get affected in, in, in uh, surgery for breast cancer. Uh, so the more we know about that, the better. So it's, it's really important if patients tell me they've, they've got an old injury from, their sh uh, from a car accident or sporting injury or any injury at all that may have happened to their shoulder, even a torn muscle is, is important to know. And same if they've had surgery to other areas of their body, you know, particularly if we're using their tummy as a, as a way to uh, rebuild their breast, then it's nice to know about injuries to that. And then, so in, in terms of your second um, question, uh, if, if patients have particular activities that they like to pursue, then that's important information as well. So if we use the example of the, the back muscle, um, because we know that affects shoulder function, there, there's good evidence to, to show that. If you're a high level swimmer, for example, uh, rock climbing or any other um, pursuit that involves a lot of pulling uh, and strength in the, in the upper body, we probably would steer away from using that sort of reconstruction and try and use one of the other methods. So if, if we can know beforehand what, you know, what suffering or what problems uh, there is regarding the shoulder or any other areas of the body, then we can hopefully tailor the reconstruction to make the recovery a lot smoother. And then you'd know if there was likely to be a problem afterwards, you'd know then to educate the woman that, wow, she needs to get on top of this for it to recover. Yeah, absolutely. So knowledge is information. Uh, and then if, if we know there's problems beforehand, then we can look specifically at trying to work even harder at trying to address them afterwards. So is it important for the woman to tell the surgeon and then the surgeon can decide if it's relevant or not? Yeah, I mean, it, sometimes things aren't relevant, but I think it's important to raise them. Uh, and the surgeons don't always remember to ask, ask the question. So it's really important that patients can help uh, and, and direct uh, you know, what we're, what we're asking and, and our knowledge. Okay. Another uh, interesting finding in the study was that women reported that they had a, a lack of knowledge that their physical function would be affected and they didn't really expect it to be, expected to be affected to the extent it was and they didn't really have any idea how to manage these physical problems that they had after their uh, breast reconstruction. Monique, You've seen a lot of women, yes, hundreds of women, yep. who've had yes, breast yep. reconstruction surgery. How affected are they physically after the surgery? I think as Dina suggested, there's quite a few different options in regards to breast reconstruction. So it does depend on the type of reconstruction that you have. Um, and it also depends on where you come in. So from a cancer treatment point of view, if you've had chemotherapy or radiotherapy beforehand, there's certainly the cancer related fatigue um, can have an impact on where you start from and the recovery post that. And also I think on your responsibilities at home, whether or not you have dependents that you need to care for or you're someone that lives alone, the um, restrictions that you have and the, the support that you'll need to help get through that can change or vary depending on that. I think you know generally most ladies when they are discharged from hospital are fairly fairly independent with getting to the shower, dressing themselves and, and gently pottering around the house, probably making a cup of tea. They're often um, held back a little bit by drain tubes that may stay in for, for several weeks, depending on the type of surgery that you have. So that certainly creates some limitation for them. 
But as I say, they're generally able to potter. They're not really able to do much more than that, certainly in the first week to two weeks. And so I stress how important it is that they um, prepare for that. I think that's really, really important and, and listen to their bodies as well. I, I tend to talk to women about the fact that as women, we tend to not listen to our bodies and, and push through, try and get the job done and, and fall in a heap at the end of the day, trying to make sure that everything's met for all the people we care for. When you're recovering from surgery, specifically breast reconstruction surgery, you really need to listen to your body mm. because that's going to help you identify any changes that occur and, and recover quicker. I think you have to be really mindful that sometimes if you're trying to push through and not listen to your body, you're putting yourself at risk of, of higher complications. So I think there certainly are some restrictions in, in what you do and they do vary from, from woman to woman. And how can women help themselves you know, to recover sooner, to recover smarter? What do you recommend women do? I think it's really important to be prepared to actually empower yourself as much as possible, to get as much information as possible about what to expect. And that can come from you know, several converse, uh, consultations with your surgeon. If you have access to a breast care nurse, utilising that and having as many face-to-face -face conversations or phone conversations as you can so that you understand what to expect. Being able to utilise um, uh, programs such as breast reconstruction awareness programs where you're actually able to meet other women so that you can see a group of women in a room that have had different types of reconstruction and also understand that there can be varied levels of recovery and know that there's a wide range of normal is important to get lots of helpful hints from these women that have been through this already about certain resources that you can set up at home things that can make um, your life a little bit easier such as Ladies that live in a, a house that has several stories, bringing their bedding down to the lower story so that they're easier for them to manage things in the first week. If you're, especially if you're living alone, making sure that things are put all at a waist height so that you're not stretching or bending too much to get things. Making sure that you have lots of people around to help you. I think again, as women, we try to just get things done by ourselves, and it's very hard to accept help. So actually putting your hand up and asking for help or accepting help that's offered a roster, especially if you have children, so that there's people around you all the time. I think women that have, that live on their own, um, that don't have dependents that they need to care for, then predominantly or generally they're able to be, you know, have someone perhaps with them for the first week and then on their own with someone popping in and out. Someone that has dependents that they need to care for, really you need to plan that you have full-time support for anywhere up to six to eight weeks post the reconstruction depending on the reconstruction that you have. Um, I also think it's important to utilise resources such as this resource. This is something that will enable you to keep coming back to it so that you can understand how best to help you get through certain situations because often there's so much chatter, there's so much of that pre-op education that it can be a bit overwhelming and you don't retain it all. So having resources such as this where you can come back, look at certain scenarios and understand how better to navigate those situations. But certainly always know that it's important to identify things early, not to be, um, not to think that perhaps I'm going to be wasting the breast care nurse's time or the surgeon's time because maybe this is nothing. It's far better to call, have a conversation and be quickly reassured than to be sitting at home with a problem that could certainly, you know, the most important thing is that we actually act on that quickly. So if women are concerned or not coping, you recommend first line of attack is Oh, most definitely call a breast care nurse if you have a breast care nurse or your surgeon, most definitely, so that then we can talk things through and, you know, quite often over the phone we're able to work out what the problem is and, and give a solution. Sometimes it can be helpful to send photographs to help with those conversations, but definitely always call the breast care nurse or your surgeon to talk through those problems. And BCNA has the helpline and, and the My Journey Online tool, so there's a lot of resources out there that women just make sure they need to ask, yeah. you know, need to ask for help. Yeah, I think that's really important because certainly there are areas where women don't have access to a breast care nurse and certainly through BCNA and other support services in your area, they're gonna be able to direct you to some great resources that can help you. And Dean, if a woman has time to prepare for a breast reconstruction, so just say she's had a mastectomy and then at a later date, she's deciding to have a breast reconstruction. So there's time to prepare and plan is there anything she can do to help her body to physically prepare and what's the benefit 
of doing that. There are things um, patients can do for sure. Um, trying to build strength, uh, increase range of movement, uh, lengthen muscles to basically make more room for the implant, for example, if you're going to use an implant. But really getting the body ready for surgery and getting the, the, um, yourself in the best condition you can be in. And usually there is a need for help with that, and that's where physiotherapists uh, are very helpful. Um, programs such as this is, this is where this is targeted, to try and basically get patients as, as physically ready as they can be. And definitely it helps. Um, there's good evidence that, that shows that if you do these sort of programs, then you'll do better from the surgery. Uh, and so we, we know with lots of things that um, early intervention is, is key. Uh, and so getting ready for the surgery is, is as early as you can get, I think. And so if you can prepare yourself physically, you'll do much better with the surgery. And it also may bring in other options that we didn't perhaps think of, you know, potentially operations that we may not consider if, if people aren't physically ready for them become options that might be really good options for those, mm. for those people. So say if a woman already has a physical limitation, so just say she's had a mastectomy and had radiotherapy and she has problems with her shoulder and you're planning on putting, uh, putting on a, a um, reconstructed breast, so if she's able to get more range in her shoulder and more strength and flexibility in that tissue, does that actually make the surgery a bit easier to do? It does. I mean, it, it, even simple things like positioning the patient for surgery, you often their arms out mm -hmm. and if, if you can't actually lift the arm up, then it makes the surgery much more difficult. Uh, if the skin's very tight, uh, and as Louise will talk about later, if you have lymphedema, that, that can make things more difficult. So anything that can reduce that, help uh, range of movement at, at various joints, increase muscle strength, uh, loosen the muscles, if you like, uh, and loosen up scar is going to be helpful in, in preparing the body for surgery. And will it make a difference to the recovery? Will it, it will. Usually it will shorten the recovery. So a little bit of work put in before the surgery will pay big dividends, big dividends afterwards when you, you won't hopefully have to do all that hard work after as, as much as you would have beforehand. But still, if a woman's having an immediate uh, breast reconstruction and she doesn't get that opportunity to do anything beforehand because it's all just happened too quick, there's still rehabilitation exercises that she can do after the surgery so she can still catch up. That yeah, absolutely. Mm. And we know that um, in that setting, if, if patients start the exercises pretty much straight away, they'll, they'll tend to do better. Obviously, they'll be guided by the surgeon and, and the breast care nurse and their physiotherapist and... and Patients shouldn't just start ad hoc, yes. you know, doing things themselves. Um, but, you know, under the guidance of their various um, treating team, then starting the exercises as soon as possible after the surgery really is, is shown to have great benefit for, for all the different types of reconstruction. Great. And Monique, as you were saying, with the, it's hard for the woman to take everything in. Yeah. So having a video demonstrating how a woman like me... Yes is doing these exercises and how she can do them at home with minimal equipment uh, would be a great resource, would you say, particularly for women who don't have access to physiotherapy, either for financial reasons or because of location or yeah. women who are in rural, remote areas and can't travel yes. uh, to access help. Uh, having a video, do you think it would... Oh, I think it'll be priceless. I think it'll just help so much because, as I said, even whether women don't have access to that education beforehand or they have been given so much education, they don't retain all the information. So being able to go back to that and, and see how they're best going to get themselves through certain situations will just be really, really helpful, most definitely. And I think even in, saying, in adding to what Dean had said in regards to the placement of the arm for, for women in regards to... Or, for surgery because their arms are out at, at the side. I often think it's really helpful to tell women, especially women that tell me that they have a history of issues with their shoulder, that they, when they go into theatre and they are um, about to be put off to sleep, that they actually let the team know in the room that I actually have a problem with this shoulder. So can you place me in the right position before I go mm. off to sleep? That way at least I can let you know what's relatively comfortable rather than being put in a position where you are actually overstretching that muscle um, and you wake up much already really mm. sore because mm. it's been put in a position that's not naturally comfortable for you. So I think it's really worthwhile noting that breast reconstruction is a wonderful thing to do. It's a really worthwhile thing to do. Uh, and it's definitely hard work. It, it takes several months for patients to recover from breast reconstruction, but it's really worthwhile. There's good evidence to show that patients who have breast reconstruction actually recover better 
in, in many ways than patients who don't. That's obviously the physical recovery we're talking about today, but also the, the mental recovery, the physical well-being, their sexual identity, their, their whole um, body tends to recover better if they have breast reconstruction. So it is a really worthwhile thing to do. And whilst it's hard work and, and there's a lot to recover from, and it does take time, in the long run, patients are much better off for it. It's not only important for circulation of blood, but also of lymph fluid, and also to try to reduce the risk of developing lymphedema. Lymphedema is one of those big words out there that sometimes women are fearful of. And I think tonight I want to really reassure women that the risk of developing lymphedema after having lymph node surgery or radiotherapy is very small. Probably one in five women may develop lymphedema. That means four in five women will not develop lymphedema. And the key message is to be aware of what lymphedema is, to talk to your breast care nurse or your surgeon about your personal risk of developing lymphedema because a woman who only has one lymph node removed as opposed to someone who has 25 lymph nodes removed is at a very different mm. risk. Mm. And so it's important to have the conversation. What is my risk? Because there's lots of people out there talking about lymphedema and sometimes there's a lot of misinformation about lymphedema out there. So lymphedema, edema means swelling. So lymphedema is a condition where some women develop some swelling in the arm or hand or even chest or breast region after having surgery or radiotherapy for breast cancer. It's really important to be in tune with your body and be aware of your own arms and body parts to be able to monitor for any early signs or symptoms. And the early signs or symptoms that are most common isn't that you're going to wake up one night, one morning, and there's going to be a big fat swollen arm. We don't see that these days because of the advancements in our surgery and medical treatment. So early signs that we're talking about are sometimes a feeling of heaviness or a dull ache in the arm, or sometimes you might notice that jewelry might be a little bit tight or sleeves might feel a little bit uncomfortable on your side that you've had the surgery on. Don't neglect any of these little signs that you think, oh, it might go away. I'd really recommend that all women see a lymphedema therapist, so a qualified therapist who can assess your situation, assess your condition, and also regularly monitor so that we can determine very early stages of lymphedema. Because like we've already said tonight, early detection and early intervention does really prevent a long-term problem of significant swelling in the arm. And with the exercises for the shoulder and the circulation, so women are you know, asked to do these in hospital, they continue them when they go home? Definitely, you want to encourage women to continue those exercises. And like was said earlier, sometimes women come to me and they've been given a handout that's got some exercises or some pictures on there, and they get home and they really don't know how to do those exercises. So that's where I think this BCNA resource will be really useful to watch the videos of the exercises. And I think it's important also to gradually upgrade the exercises over a period of time. So you're going to be doing different exercises in the first couple of weeks after surgery when there's still pain and healing, recovering happening, as opposed to six to eight weeks and to months down the track. So the goal is that all women should be able to get back to all normal activities and really whatever they want to be doing, but there needs to be a gradual upgraded approach to that. Um, and really listening to their body, being tuned with their own body and gradually upgrade the activities. So straight after the surgery, the exercises for circulation are, are really, because you're not moving, because you're quite restricted and you're in pain, so you, you're still. So you want to do those exercises in the beginning because that's really your circulation and that will help to minimise your risk of lymphedema? Correct, because while you're helping the circulation, you're also helping to stretch those muscles and then you're also helping to pump the lymphatic fluid. And the goal is to get back to normal activities but an upgraded, slow approach to it. So once a woman is, has returned to her normal function, at home, weeks and weeks down the track, then she doesn't really need to do the circulation exercises anymore because she's already moving and that's pumping her fluid, is that? 
Correct, except I still find women sometimes down the track, if they haven't been doing lots of reaching or a, a specific movement, they might still find some tightness. So I often say just every time you get out of the shower, do some of those circulation exercises to keep everything free. And as Dean was saying, like the, the shoulder exercises are really to start to get the shoulder moving again because of the reconstruction and because of the effect on the shoulder. Shoulder functions are very common problem that women have restrictions in. So the shoulder exercises are to start moving initially, but they really need to be progressed and again until woman restor restores her normal function. Is that yeah, for sure. I think that most um, everyone has different protocols. Uh, the ones I'm familiar with that we use uh, in my area tend to have a stepwise progression. Often it's a, a, a one week uh, level one sort of thing and then level two for the second week when they go home. And Obviously, they're checked with the surgeon to make sure that that particular type of reconstruction you, you're having is is the one that is the right exercise um, pattern and, and the way it steps up. Uh, but generally, I think that's 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 correct. You basically start from a fairly low level and then work your way up from there. So the women really need to make sure that they communicate with their surgeon and their breast care nurse to know what exercises they should be doing and really how much they should be doing it. Uh, in the first couple of weeks after the surgery. So the resource is giving them three basic exercises for the shoulder and recommending that they do them about four times a day. But there can be subtle variations on that depending on the way their surgery went. Yeah, so I think it's really important to make sure you, you talk to your surgeon, talk to your breast care nurse, talk to your physiotherapist and just make absolutely sure the exercises that have been advised for you are the ones that are the right ones. Uh, and that your particular surgery is is not going to you know jeopardise what exercise program we'd recommend for you. Right. We know that the physical recovery from breast reconstruction surgery is a process, and it's going to take time for women to recover, and it's going to take hard work. It doesn't happen quickly. Are there any last words or any last recommendations you'd like to make to women? Uh, I think it's really important to stress that um, early intervention, uh, so starting the exercises as soon as you can, it, ideally start them before surgery. That's where these resources are really, really helpful. I think uh, it's really well proven that if you can start the exercises, the sooner the better, and then you do have to do them. It is a, it is a, a, a process, uh, you do have to recover. It takes time, but you know, you'll get through it. So I think it's really important just to start as early as you can. I think I think for me it's uh, something I'd like ladies to remember is that it it can be a little bit of a roller coaster that recovery. You can you can feel like you've got to a level where you can start doing that little bit more and you start doing that little bit more and actually realize that you're not quite ready. So again listening to your body is really really important. There'll be some days where you can walk around a little bit more and the next day where you need to have a little bit more of a rest. Mm. So listening is really important but also looking I think after these surgeries, there's, there's quite a reduction in sensation that you have. So you can't rely on how you feel to detect those changes that may occur. And so being comfortable and able to look in the mirror, look at your body, understand how um, bruising and swelling presents itself before you leave hospital, and then understand how it may change so that you're able to identify any of those changes early. So very much feeling comfortable in yourself, looking at that reconstruction is important. Utilise the nursing staff in the ward before you're discharged to help you feel comfortable with that. So listening to your body and looking, I think, is the most important thing. And Louise? For me, I probably have two pieces of advice for women going through this reconstruction surgery. One is exercise, like Dean said, is really important. And I think if we were going to a surgeon and the surgeon told us to take a medication four times a day, we would religiously take it. And what I say to my patients is, think about exercise as your prescription of medication to help your body in order to help you to feel better within yourself, not just physically, but emotionally as well. And the second piece of advice I say to my lady is adopt the tortoise approach. Slow and steady wins the race. Mm -hmm. So you can think of being the tortoise or the hare in this recovery time, but the tortoise generally wins the race. So everything is going to be there in a little bit of time, but just take care of yourself and take things slowly. So the resource is meant to help you to go through that process. 
to guide you on the things you can do before the surgery to help prepare for it and then what you can do after the surgery to promote your recovery. This resource was produced by Breast Research Australia from the University of Wollongong and Breast Cancer Network Australia with thanks to Dry July.